Making Solomon's Mines by H. Ryder Haggard Chapter 15 Good Falls Sick After the fight was ended, Sir Henry and Good were carried into Twala's hut, where I joined them. They were both utterly exhausted by exertion and loss of blood, and indeed my own condition was little better. I am very wiry, and can stand more fatigue than most men, probably on account of my light weight and long training. But that night I was quite done up, and as is always the case when exhausted, that old wound which the lion gave me began to pain. Also my head was aching violently from the blow I had received in the morning when I was knocked senseless. Altogether a more miserable trio than we were that evening it would have been difficult to discover, and our only comfort lay in the reflection that we were exceedingly fortunate to be there to feel miserable, instead of being stretched dead upon the plain, as so many thousands of brave men were that night, who had risen well and strong in the morning. Somehow, with the assistance of the beautiful Fulata, who, since we had been the means of saving her life, had constituted herself our handmaiden, and especially goods, we managed to get off the chain shirts, which had certainly saved the lives of two of us that day. As I expected, we found that the flesh underneath was terribly contused, for though the steel links had kept the weapons from entering, they had not prevented them from bruising. Both Sir Henry and Good were a mass of contusions, and I was by no means free. As a remedy, Fulata brought us some pounded green leaves with an aromatic odor, which, when applied as a plaster, gave us considerable relief. But though the bruises were painful, they did not give us such anxiety as Sir Henry's and Good's wounds. Good had a hole right through the fleshy part of his beautiful white leg, from which he had lost a great deal of blood, and Sir Henry, with other hurts, had a deep cut over the jaw, inflicted by Twala's battle-axe. Luckily Good is a very decent surgeon, and so soon as his small box of medicines was forthcoming, having thoroughly cleansed the wounds, he managed to stitch up first Sir Henry's and then his own pretty satisfactorily, considering the imperfect light given by the primitive Kukuana lamp in the hut. Afterwards he plentifully smeared the injured places with some antiseptic ointment, of which there was a pot in the little box, and we covered them with the remains of a pocket handkerchief which we possessed. Meanwhile, Fulata had prepared us some strong broth, for we were too weary to eat. This we swallowed, and then threw ourselves down on the piles of magnificent carasses or fur rugs, which were scattered about the dead king's great hut. By a very strange instance of the irony of fate, it was on Twala's own couch, and wrapped in Twala's own particular carass, that Sir Henry, the man who had slain him, slept that night. I say slept, but after that day's work, sleep was indeed difficult. To begin with, in truth, the air was full of farewells to the dying and mournings for the dead. From every direction came the sound of the wailing of women whose husbands, sons, and brothers had perished in the battle. No wonder that they wailed, for over 12,000 men, or nearly a fifth of the Kukuana army, had been destroyed in that awful struggle. It was heart-rending to lie and listen to their cries for those who never would return and it made me understand the full horror of the work done that day to further man's ambition. Towards midnight, however, the ceaseless crying of the women grew less frequent, till at length the silence was only broken at intervals of a few minutes by a long piercing howl that came from a hut in our immediate rear. 
which, as I afterwards discovered, proceeded from Gagool, keening over the dead King Twala. After that I got a little fitful sleep, only to wake from time to time with a start, thinking that I was once more an actor in the terrible events of the last twenty-four hours. Now I seemed to see that warrior whom my hand had sent to his last account charging at me on the mountain top. Now I was once more in that glorious ring of greys, which made its immortal stand against all Twala's regiments upon the little mound. And now again I saw Twala's plumed and gory head roll past my feet with gnashing teeth and glaring eyes. At last, somehow or other, the night passed away. But when dawn broke, I found that my companions had slept no better than myself. Good, indeed, was in a high fever, and very soon afterwards began to grow light-headed, and also, to my alarm, to spit blood, the result, no doubt, of some internal injury inflicted during the desperate efforts made by the Kukuana warrior on the previous day to force his big spear through the chain armor. Sir Henry, however, seemed pretty fresh, notwithstanding his wound on the face, which made eating difficult and laughter an impossibility, though he was so sore and stiff that he could scarcely stir. About eight o'clock we had a visit from Infadus, who appeared but little the worse, tough old warrior that he was, for his exertions in the battle although he informed us that he had been up all night. He was delighted to see us, but much grieved at Good's condition, and shook our hands cordially. I noticed, however, that he addressed Sir Henry with a kind of reverence, as though he were something more than man, and indeed, as we afterwards found out, the great Englishman was looked on throughout Kukuana land as a supernatural being. No man, the soldiers said, could have fought as he fought, or, at the end of a day of such toil and bloodshed, could have slain Twala, who, in addition to being the king, was supposed to be the strongest warrior in the country, in single combat, shearing through his bull neck at a stroke. Indeed, that stroke became proverbial in Kukuana land, and any extraordinary blow or feat of strength was henceforth known as Inkubu's blow. Infadus told us also that all Twala's regiments had submitted to Ignosi, and that like submissions were beginning to arrive from chiefs in the outlying country. Twala's death at the hands of Sir Henry had put an end to all further chances of disturbances, for Scraga had been his only legitimate son, so there was no rival claimant to the throne left alive. I remarked that Ignosi had swum to power through blood. The old chief shrugged his shoulders. Yes, he answered, but the Kukuwana people can only be kept cool by letting their blood flow sometimes. Many are killed indeed, but the women are left and others must soon grow up to take the places of the fallen. After this, the land would be quiet for a while. Afterwards, in the course of the morning, we had a short visit from Mignosi, on whose brows the royal diadem was now bound. As I contemplated him advancing with kingly dignity, an obsequious guard following his steps, I could not help recalling to my mind the tall Zulu who had presented himself to us at Durban some months back, asking to be taken into our service, and reflecting on the strange revolutions of the wheel of fortune. "'Hail, O king,' I said, rising. "'Yes, Makumazan, king at last, by the might of your three right hands,' was the ready answer." All was, he said, going well, and he hoped to arrange a great feast in two weeks' time in order to show himself to the people. 
I asked him what he had settled to do with Gagool. "'She is the evil genius of the land,' he answered, "'and I shall kill her, and all the witch-doctors with her. "'She has lived so long that none can remember when she was not very old. "'And she it is who has always trained the witch-hunters "'and made the land wicked in the sight of the heavens above.' "'Yet she knows much,' I replied. "'It is easier to destroy knowledge, Ignosi, than to gather it.' "'That is so,' he said thoughtfully. "'She, and only she, knows the secret of the three witches yonder, "'whither the great road runs, where the kings are buried, and the silent ones sit. "'Yes, and the diamonds are.' Forget not thy promise, Ignosi, thou must lead us to the mines, even if thou hast to spare Gagool alive to show the way. I will not forget, Macumazahn, and I will think on what thou sayest. After Ignosi's visit I went to see Good, and found him quite delirious. The fever set up by his wound seemed to have taken a firm hold of his system and to be complicated with an internal injury. For four or five days his condition was most critical. Indeed, I believe it firmly, that had it not been for Fulanta's indefatigable nursing, he must have died. Women are women all the world over, whatever their color. Yet somehow it seemed curious to watch this dusky beauty "'bending night and day over the fevered man's couch "'and performing all the merciful errands of a sick-room "'swiftly, gently, and with as fine an instinct "'as that of a trained hospital nurse. "'For the first night or two I tried to help her, "'and so did Sir Henry, as soon as his stiffness allowed him to move. "'But Fulata bore our interference with impatience "'and finally insisted upon our leaving him to her.' saying that our movements made him restless, which I think was true. Day and night she watched him and tended him, giving him his only medicine, a native cooling drink made of milk, in which was infused juice from the bulb of a species of tulip, and keeping the flies from settling on him. I can see the whole picture now as it appeared night after night by the light of our primitive lamp, Good, tossing to and fro, his features emaciated, his eyes shining large and luminous, and jabbering nonsense by the yard, and seated on the ground by his side, her back resting against the wall of the hut, the soft-eyed, shapely Kukuana beauty, her face, weary as it was with her long vigil, animated by a look of infinite compassion. Or was it something more than compassion? For two days we thought that he must die, and crept about with heavy hearts. Only Fulata would not believe it. He will live, she said. For three hundred yards or more around Twala's chief hut, where the sufferer lay, there was silence. For by the king's order all who lived in the habitations behind it, except Sir Henry and myself, had been removed, lest any noise should come to the sick man's ears. One night, it was the fifth of Good's illness, as was my habit, I went across to see how he was doing before turning in for a few hours. I entered the hut carefully. The lamp placed upon the floor showed the figure of Good tossing no more but lying quite still. So it had come at last. In the bitterness of my heart I gave something like a sob. Hush! came from the patch of dark shadow behind Good's head. Then, creeping closer, I saw that he was not dead, but sleeping soundly, with Fulata's taper fingers clasped tightly in his poor white hand. The crisis had passed, and he would live. He slept like that for eighteen hours, and I scarcely like to say it, for I fear I should not be believed, 
but during the entire period did this devoted girl sit by him, fearing that if she moved and drew away her hand it would wake him. What she must have suffered from cramp and weariness, to say nothing of want of food, nobody will ever know. But it is the fact that, when at last he woke, she had to be carried away. Her limbs were so stiff that she could not move them. After the turn had once been taken, Good's recovery was rapid and complete. It was not till he was nearly well that Sir Henry told him all he owed to Fulata. And when he came to the story of how she sat by his side for eighteen hours, fearing lest by moving she would wake him, the honest sailor's eyes filled with tears. He turned and went straight to the hut where Fulata was preparing the midday meal, for we were back in our old quarters now, taking me with him to interpret in case he could not make his meaning clear to her, though I am bound to say that she understood him marvelously as a rule, considering how extremely limited was his foreign vocabulary. Tell her, said Good, that I owe her my life, and that I will never forget her kindness to my dying day. I interpreted, and under her dark skin she actually seemed to blush. Turning to him with one of those swift and graceful motions that in her always reminded me of the flight of a wild bird, Fulata answered softly, glancing at him with her large brown eyes, Nay, my lord, my lord forgets, did he not save my life, and am I not my lord's handmaiden? It will be observed that the young lady appeared entirely to have forgotten the share which Sir Henry and myself had taken in her preservation from Twala's clutches. But that is the way of women. I remember my dear wife was just the same. Well, I retired from that little interview sad at heart. I did not like Miss Fulata's soft glances, for I knew the fatal amorous propensities of sailors in general, and of good in particular. There are two things in the world, as I have found out, which cannot be prevented. You cannot keep a Zulu from fighting, or a sailor from falling in love upon the slightest provocation. It was a few days after this last occurrence that Ignosi held his great indaba, or council, and was formally recognized as king by the Indunas, or headmen, of Kukuanaland. The spectacle was a most imposing one, including, as it did, a grand review of troops. On this day the remaining fragments of the greys were formally paraded, and in the face of the army thanked for their splendid conduct in battle. To each man the king made a large present of cattle, promoting them one and all to the rank of officers in the new corps of greys, which was in process of formation. An order was also promulgated throughout the length and breadth of Kukuanalan, that whilst we honored the country by our presence, we three were to be greeted with the royal salute, and to be treated with the same ceremony and respect that was by custom accorded to the king. Also, the power of life and death was publicly conferred upon us. Ignosi, too, in the presence of his people, reaffirmed the promises which he had made, to the effect that no man's blood should be shed without trial, and that witch-hunting should cease in the land. When the ceremony was over, we waited upon Ignosi, and informed him that we were now anxious to investigate the mystery of the mines to which Solomon's road ran, asking him if he had discovered anything about them. My friends, he answered, I have discovered this. It is there that the three great figures sit, who here are called the Silent Ones, and to whom Twala would have offered the girl Fulata as a sacrifice. It is there, too, in a great cave deep in the mountain, that the kings of the land are buried. 
There ye shall find Twala's body, sitting with those who went before him. There also is a deep pit, which at some time long dead men dug out, mayhap for the stones ye speak of, such as I have heard men in Natal tell of at Kimberley. There, too, in the place of death is a secret chamber, known to none but the king and Gagool. But Twala, who knew it, is dead, and I know it not, nor know I what is in it. Yet there is a legend in the land that once, many generations ago, a white man crossed the mountains, and was led by a woman to the secret chamber, and shown the wealth hidden in it, but before he could take it she betrayed him, and he was driven by the king of that day back to the mountains, and since then no man has entered the place. The story is surely true, Ignosi, for on the mountains we found the white man, I said. Yes, we found him, and now I have promised you that if ye can come to that chamber, and the stones are there, the gem upon thy forehead proves they are there, I put in, pointing to the great diamond I had taken from Twala's dead brows. Mayhap, if they are there, he said, ye shall have as many as ye can take hence, if indeed ye would leave me, my brothers. First we must find the chamber, said I. There is but one who can show it to thee, Gagool. And if she will not, then she must die, said Ignosi sternly. I have saved her alive, but for this. Stay, she shall choose. And calling to a messenger, he ordered Gagool to be brought before him. In a few minutes she came, hurried along by two guards, whom she was cursing as she walked. Leave her said the king to the guards. But as soon as their support was withdrawn, the withered old bundle, for she looked more like a bundle than anything else, out of which her two bright and wicked eyes gleamed like those of a snake, sank in a heap onto the floor. "'What will ye with me, Ignosi?' she piped. "'Ye dare not touch me. If ye touch me, I will slay you as ye sit.' "'Beware of my magic!' "'Thy magic could not save Twala, old she-wolf, "'and it cannot hurt me,' was the answer. "'Listen, I will this of thee, "'that thou reveal to us the chamber "'where are the shining stones.' "'Ha-ha!' she piped. "'None know its secret but I, "'and I will never tell thee.' THE WHITE DEVILS SHALL GO HENCE EMPTY-HANDED. THOU SHALL TELL ME. I WILL MAKE THEE TELL ME. HOW, O KING, THOU ART GREAT, BUT CAN THY POWER WRING THE TRUTH FROM A WOMAN? IT IS DIFFICULT, YET WILL I DO SO. HOW, O KING? Nay, thus, if thou tellest not, thou shalt slowly die. Die! she shrieked in terror and fury. Ye dare not touch me! Man, ye know not who I am! How old think ye am I? I knew your fathers, and your fathers' fathers' fathers. When the country was young, I was here. When the country grows old, I shall still be here. I cannot die unless I be killed by chance, for none dare slay me. Yet will I slay thee. See, Gagool, mother of evil, thou art so old that thou canst no longer love thy life. What can life be to such a hag as thou, who hast no shape, nor form, nor hair, nor teeth, hast naught save wickedness and evil eyes? 
it will be mercy to make an end of thee, Gagool. Thou fool! shrieked the old fiend. Thou accursed fool! Deemest thou that life is sweet only to the young? It is not so, and not thou knowest of the heart of man to think it. To the young, indeed, death is sometimes welcome, for the young can feel. They love and suffer, and it wrings them to see their beloved pass to the land of shadows. But the old feel not, they love not, and <laughs> they laugh to see another go out into the dark. Ha <laughs> ha! They laugh to see the evil that is done under the stars. All they love is life, the warm, warm sun, and the sweet, sweet air. They are afraid of the cold, afraid of the cold and the dark. Ha <laughs> ha ha! And the old hag writhed in ghastly merriment on the ground. Cease thine evil talk and answer me said Ignosi angrily. Wilt thou show the place where the stones are, or wilt thou not? If thou wilt not, thou diest even now. And he seized a spear and held it over her. I will not show it. Thou darest not kill me. Darest not. He who slays me will be accursed for ever. Slowly Ignosi brought down the spear till it pricked the prostrate heap of rags. With a wild yell, Gagool sprang to her feet, then fell again and rolled upon the floor. Nay, I will show thee, only let me live. Let me sit in the sun and have a bit of meat to suck, and I will show thee. It is well. I thought that I should find a way to reason with thee. Tomorrow shalt thou go with Infadus and my white brothers to the place. And beware how thou failest, for if thou showest it not, then thou shalt slowly die. I have spoken. I will not fail, Ignosi. I always keep my word. <laughs> Once before a woman showed the chamber to a white man, and behold, evil befell him. And here her wicked eyes glinted. Her name was Gagool also. Perchance I was that woman. 